Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons, Chapter 11. The bowl was bellowing. The steady sound went up into the air in a dark red column. Seth leaned moodily on the hoot piece, on the hoot piece watching Reuben, who was slowly but deftly repairing a leak in the midden rail. Not a bud broke the dark feathery faces of the thorns, but the air whined with spring's passage. It was eleven in the morning. A bird sang his idiotic recessive from the dairy roof. Both brothers looked up as Flora came across the yard, dressed and dressed for her walk upon the downs. She looked inquiringly at the shed, whence issued the shocking row made by Big Business, the bull. I think it would be a good idea if you let him out, she said. Seth grinned and nudged Reuben, who colored dully. I don't mean for stud purposes. I meant simply for air and exercise, said Flora. You cannot expect a bull to produce healthy stock if he is shut up in the smelly dock all day. Seth disapproved of the impersonal note which the conversation had taken, so he lounged away. But Reuben was always ready to listen to advice, which had the, the good of the farm at heart. And Flora had discovered this, he said quite civilly. Aye, tis true. We mun letten out in the great field tomorrow. He returned to his repairing of the midden rail. But just as Flora was walking away, he looked up again and remarked, So, you went with the old devil, eh? Flora was learning how to translate Starkadder Argot, the Starkadder Argot, and took this to mean that she had, last week, accompanied her cousin Amos to the Church of the Quivering Brethren. She replied in tones just tinged with polite surprise, I am not quite sure what you mean, but if you mean did I go with Cousin Amos to be a Sean, yes, I did. Aye, you went, and you did the old and did the old devil say anything about me? Flora could only recall a remark about dead man's shoes, which it would scarcely be prudent to repeat, so she replied that she did not remember much of what had ha of what had been said, because the sermon had been so powerful that it had driven everything else out of her head. I was advising Cousin Amos, she added, to address his sermons to a wider audience. I think he could, he ought to go round the country on a lorry preaching. Frittering the harness birds off the bushes, more like, interposed Reuben gloomily. At fairs and on market days, you see, if Cousin Amos were away a good deal, it would mean that someone else would have to take charge of the farm, wouldn't it? Someone else will have to take charge of it in any case when the old devil dies, said Reuben. Stark passion curdled the whites of his eyes, and his breath came th came thra. Yes, of course, said Flora. He talks of leaving it to Adam. Now, I don't think that would be at all wise to you. To begin with, Adam is ninety. He has no children, at least he has none so far as I know. And, of course, I do not listen to what Mrs. Beadle says. I should not think he is likely to marry, should you? Nor has he the legal right of, nor has he the legal type of mind. I should imagine he would trouble to make a will. I shouldn't imagine he would trouble to make a will. For example, and if he did make one, who knows who he would leave the farm to? He might leave it to feckless or even to aimless. And that would mean a lot of legal trouble, for I doubt if two cows can inherit a farm, then again, pointless, pointless and graceless might put a claim for it, and that could easily mean an, an endless lawsuit in which all the resources of the farm would be swallowed up. Oh no, I hardly think it would do for Cousin Amos to leave the farm to Adam. I think it would be much better if he were persuaded to go on a preaching tour around England, or perhaps to retire to some village a long way off, and write a nice long book of sermons. Then, whoever was left in charge of the farm could get a good grip of affairs here. And Wes, when, when Cousin Amos did come back at last, he would see that the management of the farm must be left in the hands of that person in order to save all the bother of getting things reorganized. You see, Reuben, Cousin Amos could not think of leaving the farm to Adam then, because the person who had been managing it would obviously be the person to leave it to. She faltered a little toward the end of her speech as she recalled that the Starcatters rarely did what was obvious, though they were only too embarrassingly ready to do what was natural. Nor did her remarks have the wished-for effect upon Reuben. He said in a voice thick with fury, Meaning you? No, indeed, I've already told you, Reuben, that I shouldn't, that I should be no use at all at running the farm. Do you think you might believe me? If you don't mean you, who do you mean? 
Flora abandoned diplomacy and said, You! Me? I! You! She patiently dropped into Stark at her. He stared thickly at her. She observed with distaste that his chest was extremely hairy. Tis impossible, he said at last. The old lady would never let go. Let him go. Why not? asked Flora. Why should he not go? Why does Aunt Ada Doom like to keep you all here as though you were all children? She, she, she's ill, stammered Reuben, casting a fleeting glance at the closed, dusty windows of the farm high above his head, where the lintits were already building under the sheaves. If any of us says we'll leave the farm, she gets an attack. They have always been stark at us at cold comfort. None of us mun go, except Harkaway, when he takes the money down to the bank at Beershawn every Saturday morning. But you all go into Beershawn sometimes. Aye, but tis a great risk. If she knew, it would bring a, on an attack. <coughs> Excuse me. An attack of what? Flora was getting a little impatient. Unlike Charles, she deplored a gloomy mystery. Her, her illness. She, she ain't like other people's grandmothers. When she was no bigger than a linnet, she saw, Oh, Reuben, do hurry up and tell me, there's a good soul. All the sun will be gone by the time I get to the, I get onto the downs. She, she's mad. Flat and dark, the word lay between them in the indifferent air. Time, which had been behaving normally lately, suddenly began to spin open, or began to spin upon a bright point in endless space. It never rains, but it pours. Oh, said Flora thoughtfully. So that was it. Aunt Ada Doom was mad. You would expect, by all laws of probability, to find a mad grandmother at Cold Comfort Farm. And for once, the laws of probability had not done you down, and a mad grandmother there was. Flora observed, tapping her shoe with her walking stick, that it was very awkward. Aye, said Reuben, tis terrible. And her madness takes the form of wanting to know everything that goes on. She has to see all the books twice a week. The milk book, and the chicken book, and the pig book, and, and corn book. If we keeps the books back, she has an attack. Tis terrible. She's the head of the family, you see. We mun keep her alive at all costs. She never comes downstairs but twice a year, on the first of May and the last day of the harvest festival. If anybody eats too much, she has an attack. Tis terrible. It is indeed, agreed Flora. It struck her that Aunt Ada Doom's madness had taken the most convenient for impossible if everybody who went mad could arrange in what way it was to take them. She felt pretty sure they would all choose to be mad like Ada Doom. Is that why she doesn't want to see me? She asked. I've been here nearly a month, you know, and I have seen and I have and I have not and I have never seen her yet. Aye, maybe, said Reuben indifferently. His long speech seemed to have exhausted him. His face was sodden, sunk on itself in defensive folds. Well, anyway, said Flora briskly, because Aunt Ada is mad, there is no reason why you should not try to persuade Cousin Amos to go on a preaching tour and then manage the farm while he is away. You have a stab at it. Do you think, said Reuben slowly, that if I was to look after the farm while the old devil was away, moithering about hellfire, and a lot of fritted birds and cows a long way off, he'd come back and see as I could do it and maybe leave it to me for my own when he's gone. Yes, I do, said Flora firmly. Reuben's face became contorted with a number of emotions, and suddenly, even as she watched him, victory was hers. Aye, he said hoarsely. Dang me if I don't din into the old devil. Now he must be off speechifying this very week. And much to her surprise, he held out his hand to her. She took it and shook it warmly. This was the first sign of humanity she had encountered among the Stark Adders, and she was moved by it. She felt like Stout Cortez or Sir James Jeans on spotting yet another white dwarf. She was cheerful as she walked away toward the downland path. If Reuben did not overdo the persuading stunt, and this was a real danger, for Amos was astute and would soon see through any obvious attempt to get rid of him, her plan should succeed. It was a fresh, pleasant morning, and she felt the more disposed to enjoy her walk because Mr. Mybug, she had not learned to think of him as, as Meyerburn, was not with her. For the last three mornings he had been with her, but this morning he had said that he really ought to do some work. 
for it, not see why, but one excuse was as good as another to get rid of him. It cannot be said that Flora really enjoyed ta taking walks with Mr. Mybug. To begin with, he was not really interested in anything but sex. This was understandable, if deplorable. After all, many of our best minds have the same weak have had the same weakness. The trouble about Mr. Mybug was that ordinary objects, which are not usually associated with sex, even by our best minds, did suggest sex to Mr. Mybug, and he pointed them out and made comparisons and asked Flora what she thought about it all. Flora found it difficult to reply because she was not interested. She therefore obliged she therefore obliged merely to be polite, and Mr. Mybug mistook her lack of enthusiasm and thought it was due to inhibitions. He remarked how curious it was that most English women, most young English women that was, English women about 19 to 24, were inhibited. Cold, that was what young English women from 19 to 24 were. They used sometimes to walk through a pleasant wood of young birch trees, which were just beginning to come into bud, the stems reminded Mr. Mybug of phallic symbols, and the buds made Mr. Mybug think of nipples and vaginas. Mr. Mybug pointed out to Flora that he and she were walking on seeds which were germinating in the womb of the earth. He said it made him feel as if he were trampling on the body of a great brown woman. He felt as if he were a partner in some mighty rite of gestation. Flora used sometimes to ask him the name of a tree, but he never knew. Yet there were occasions when he would not rem when he was not reminded of a pair of large breasts by the distant hills. Then he would stand looking at the woods upon the horizon. He would wrinkle up his eyes and breathe deeply through his nostrils and say that the view reminded him of one of Poussin's lovely things. Or he would pause and peer in a pool and say it was like a painting by Manet. And to be fair to Mr. Mybug, it must be admitted he was sometimes interested by the social problems of the day. Only yesterday, while he and Flora were walking through an alley of rhododendrons on an estate which was open to the public, he had discussed a case of arrest in Hyde Park. The rhododendrons made him think of Hyde Park. He said that it was impossible to sit down for five minutes in Hyde Park after seven o'clock in the evening without being either accosted or arrested. There were many homosexuals to be seen in Hyde Park, prostitutes too. God, these rhododendron buds had a phallic urgent look. Sooner or later, he should have to tackle the problem of homosexuality. We should have to tackle the problem of lesbians and old maids. God, that little pool down there in the hollow was shaped just like somebody's navel. He would like to drag off his clothes and leap into it. There was another problem. We should have to tackle that too. In no other country but England was there so much pruriency about nakedness. If we all went about naked, sexual desire would automatically disappear. Had Flora ever been to a party where everybody took off their clothes? Mr. Mybug had. Once, a whole lot of us bathed in the river with nothing on, and afterwards, little Harriet Belmont sat naked in the grass and played to us on her flute. It was delicious, so gay and simple and natural. And Billy Polesweat danced a Hawaiian love dance, making all the gestures that are usually omitted in the stage version. Her husband had danced, too. It had been lovely, so warm and natural, and real somehow. So, taking it all round, Flora was pleased to have her walk in solitude. She passed a girl riding on a pony, and two young men walking with knapsacks and sticks, but no one else. She went down into a valley, filled with bushes of hazel and gorse, and made her way toward a little house built of gray stones. Its roof painted turquoise green, which stood on the other rise of the down. It was a shepherd's hut. She could see the stone hut close to it, which the, in which the ewes were kept at lambing time and a shallow trough from which they drank. Mr. Mybug had been there. If Mr. Mybug had been there, he would have said that the ewes were paying the female things tribute to the life force. He said a woman's success could only be estimated by the success of her sexual life, and Flora supposed he would say the same thing about a ewe. Oh, she was glad he wasn't there. She went skipping round the corner of the little sheep house and saw Elphine sitting on a turf and sunning herself. Both cousins were startled, but Flora was quite pleased. She wanted a chance to talk to Elphine. Elphine jumped to her feet and stood poised. She had something of the brittle grace of a yearling foal. A dryad smile played on the curious, sullen purity of her mouth. But her eyes were unawake and unfriendly, Flora thought. What a dreadful way of doing one's hair. Surely it must be a mistake. 
You're Flora. I'm Elfine, said the other girl simply. Her voice had a breathless, broken quality that suggested the fluty, sexless timbre of a choir boy's notes. Only choir boys are seldom sexless, are seldom sexless, as many a harassed vicarous knows to her cost. No prizes indeed, thought Flora rather rudely, but she said politely, Yes, isn't it a delicious morning? Have you been far? Yes, no. Away over there, the vague gesture of her outflung arm stretched in some curious fashion, illimitable horizons. Judith's gestures said the same barrier, Judith's gestures had the same barrierless quality. There was not a vase left anywhere on the farm. I feel stifled in the house, Alfine went on shyly and abruptly. I hate houses. Indeed, said Flora. She observed Alfine draw a deep breath and knew that she was about to get well away on a good long description of herself and her habits, as these shy dryads always did when you gave them half a chance. So she sat down on another turf in the sun and composed herself to listen, looking up at the tall Elfine. Do you like poetry? asked Elfine suddenly. A pure flood of color ran up under her skin, her hands burnt and bone mottled as a boy's were her hands burnt and bone mottled as a boy's were clenched. Some of it, tried, replied, uh, responded Flora cautiously. I adore it, said Elfine simply. It says all the things I can't say for myself. Somehow, it means... Oh, I don't know. Just everything somehow. It's enough. Do you ever feel that? Flora replied that she had occasionally felt something of the sort, but her reply was limited to the fact that she was not quite sure exactly what Elfine meant. I write poetry, said Elfine. So I was right, thought Flora. I'll show you some. If you promise not to laugh, I can't bear my children to be laughed at. I call my poems my children. Flora felt that she could promise this with safety. And love, too, said Elfine, her voice breaking and changing shyly, like the Finnish ice under the first lusty rays and wooing winds of the Finnish spring. Love and poetry go together somehow. Out here on the hills, when I'm alone with my dreams, oh, I can't tell you how I feel. I've been chasing a squirrel all morning, all the morning. Flora said severely, Elfine, are you engaged? Her cousin stood perfectly still. Slowly, the color receded from her face. Her head drooped. She muttered, there's someone. We don't want to spoil things by having anything definite and binding. It's horrible to bind anyone down. Nonsense, it is a very good idea, said Flora austerely. And it is a good thing for you to be bound down too. Now what do you suppose will happen to you if you don't marry this someone? Elfine's face brightened. Oh, but I've got it all planned out, she said eagerly. I shall get a job with an arts and crafts shop in Horsham, and do barbola work in my spare time. I shall be all right, and later on I can go to Italy and perhaps learn to be a little like St. Francis of Assisi. It is quite unnecessary for a young woman to resemble St. Francis of Assisi, said Flora coldly. In your case, it would be downright suicidal. A large girl like you must wear clothes that fit, and Elfine, whatever you do, Always wear court shoes. Remember, C-O-U-R-T. You are so handsome that you can wear the most conventional clothes and look very well in them. But do, for heaven's sake, avoid orange linen jumpers and hand-wrought jewellery. Oh, and shawls in the evening. She paused. She saw by Elfine's expression that she had been progressing too quickly. Elfine looked puzzled and extremely wretched. Flora was penitent. She had taken a fancy to the ridiculous chit. She said in a very friendly tone, drawing her cousin down to sit beside her. Now, what is it? Tell me. Do you hate being at home? Yes, but I'm not often there, whispered Elfine. No, it's Urk. Urk. That was the foxy-looking little man who was always staring at Flora's ankles or else spitting into the well. What about Urk? she demanded. He... 
They... I think he wants to marry me, stammered Elfine. I think Grandmother means me to marry him when I am eighteen. He... He... Climbs the apple tree outside my window and tries to watch me going on... To... To bed. I had to hang up three face towels over the window, and then he poked them down with a fishing rod and laughed and shook his fist at me. I don't know what to do. Fora was justly indignant, but concealed her nasty temper. It was at this moment that she resolved to adopt Elfine and rescue her in the teeth of all and rescue her in the teeth of all stark adders of cold comfort. And does someone know this? she asked. Well, I told him. What did he say? Oh, he said, rotten luck, old girl. It's Dick Hawk Monitor, isn't it? Oh, how did you know? Oh, I suppose everybody knows by now. It's beastly. Things are certainly rather a mess, but I do not think we need go so far as to say they are beastly, said Flora more calmly. Now, you must forgive my asking you these questions, Elfine, but has the young hawk monitor actually asked you to marry him? Well, he said he thought it would be a good idea if we did. Bad, bad, muttered Flora, shaking her head. Forgive me, but does he seem to love you? He... He does when I'm there. Flora, but I don't somehow think he thinks much about me when I'm not there. And I suppose you care enough for him, my dear, to wish to become his wife? Elfine, after some hesitation, admitted that she had sometimes been selfish enough to wish that she had Dick all to herself. It appeared that there was a dangerous cousin named Pamela who came down often from London for weekends. Dick thought she was great fun. Flora's expression did not change. But she heard this piece of new when she heard this piece of news, but her spirits sank. It would be difficult enough to win Dick for Elfine as it was. It would be a thousandfold more difficult with a rival in the field. But her spirit was that of rare but her spirit was of that rare brand which becomes cold and pleased at the prospect of a battle, and her dismay did not last. Elfine was saying, And there's this dance. Of course, I hate dancing unless it's in the woods with the windflowers and the birds, but I did rather want to go to this one, because you see it's Dick's 21st birthday party, and somehow I think it would be rather fun. Amusing or diverting, not rather fun, corrected Flora kindly. Have you been, not been invited? Oh, no. You see, Grandmother does not allow the Stark Adders to accept invitations, unless it is the funerals or the, churning of, or the churching of women. So no one sends us invitations. Dick did say he wished that I was coming, but I think he was only being kind. I don't think he really thought for a minute that I should be able to. I suppose it would be of no use asking a grandmother for permission to go. In dealing with old and tyrannical persons, it is wise to do the correct thing whenever one can. They are less likely to suspect one does when one does something incorrect. Oh, I am sure she would never let me go. She quarrelled with Mr. Hawk Monitor nearly thirty years ago, and she hates Dick's mother. She would be mad with rage if she thought that I even knew Dick. Besides, she thinks dancing is wicked. An interesting survival of medieval spec an interesting survival of medieval superstition, commented Flora. Now listen, Elfine. I think it would be an excellent move if you went to this dance. I will try and see if I can manage it. I shall go too and keep an eye on you. It may be a little difficult to secure invitations for us, but I will do my best, and when we have got our invitations, I will take you up to town with me, and we, and we will buy you a frock. Oh, Flora! Flora was pleased to see that this wild bird-come-dryad atmosphere which hung over Elfine like a pestilential vapor was wearing thin. She was talking quite naturally. If this was the good effect of a little ordinary feminine gossip and a little interest in her poor childish affairs, the effect was a well the effect of a well cut dress and brushed and, and a brushed and burnished head of hair might be miraculous. Flora could have rubbed her hands with glee. When is this dance? she asked. Will many people be asked? 
It's on the 21st of April, just a month from tomorrow. Oh yes, it will be very big. They are holding it in the assembly rooms of Godmere. And all the country will be asked because you see it's Dick's 21st birthday. All the better, thought Flora. It will be easier to work on it to work an invitation. She had so many friends in London. Surely there must be among them someone who knew these hawk monitors. And Claude Hart Harris could come down to partner her because he waltzed so well. And who could be an escort for Elfine? Does Seth dance? she asked. I don't know. I hate him, said Elfine simply. I cannot say that I like him much myself, confessed Flora. But if he dances, I think it would be as well if he came with us. You must have a partner, you know, or perhaps you could ask some other man. But Elfine, being a dryad, naturally knew no other men. The only man Flora could think of who would be sure to be available for April 21st was Mr. Mybug. She had only to ask him, she knew, and he would come bounding along to partner Elfine. It was dreadful to have no choice but Seth or Mr. Mybug, but Sussex was like that. Well, we can arrange these details later, she said. What I must do now is find out if anyone in London among my friends knows these hawk monitors. I will ask Claude. He knows the positive heads of people who live in country houses. I will write to him this afternoon. She was well disposed enough toward Elfine, but she really did not wish to spend with her the rest of that exquisite morning. So she rose to her feet, and with a pleasant smile, having promised her cousin to let her know how matters were progressing, she went on her way. And that is the end of chapter 11.